Right, just in case you're on holiday and wondering what to do to fill the time, here's another episode of the Sustainable Futures Report. And this one is for Friday the 23rd of August. Yeah, I'm Anthony Day and I'm continuing to share my thoughts on sustainability and I'm delighted to see that so many of you, indeed more than ever, are listening to this podcast. I mentioned last time that Julia Hartley Brewer of Talk Radio wanted to know what I thought about the decision of Goldsmith College to ban beef. I recorded the interview and created this episode and congratulated myself on getting it all set up and ready to roll a whole four days in advance. And then Talk Radio rang me again. Isn't it time they gave me my own programme? And asked if I talked to Mike Graham about Elton John flying Harry and family by private jet and whether paying to offset the carbon footprint was just hypocrisy. I recorded that one too. I've recovered and rejigged my original episode, so now you get two for the price of one. Anyway, here's how the first interview went. Just remember, to err is human. Uh, right, let's turn our attention back here to uh, Coldsmiths College in U- the University of London. From next month, they've said they're going to remove all beef products from their shops and cafes and from the canteen. No burgers, no lasagna, no chilli, no tacos, all taken off the menu. Why? Well, because they're banning beef as part of efforts to f- tackle climate change. They're also going to charge students a levy of 10p on bottles of water and single-use plastic cups. Uh, and this is all part of a drive for the university to become carbon neutral by 2025. They're going to install solar palace panels and a switch to a clean energy supplier. Also, they're going to require all academic courses to include studies on climate change. Professor Francis Corner, the warden of Goldsmith, says declaring a climate emergency cannot be empty words. Well, it is actually going to achieve anything. Let's talk to Anthony Day, who's an environmental consultant and host of the Sustainable Futures Report, which is a podcast on environmental issues. Good morning to you, Anthony. Good morning. Good morning. I mean, my first advice to anyone reading this would be, if you are planning to go to Goldsmiths, is change to another university and go somewhere sensible. But I do worry there aren't that many other sensible universities. You, however, I imagine, uh, are very concerned with these issues. You think this is all a good move? Well, I think it's a good thing to raise um, awareness of, uh, of the climate crisis. Uh, I don't think actually banning beef is going to make a, a big change on the world scale. But um, I, I think uh, that uh, raising the profile is good. I think there's more they could do, but, of but course. We often, see, we often talk about raising profile, and this is what like, the Extinction Rebellion people... I mean, but as far as I can tell, what they're doing is basically everything the Extinction Rebellion uh, has, uh, has been calling for them to do uh, without any, any questions. But they always talk about we need to raise the profile. Good Lord, the world talks about... Well, the, world, the Western world, the, the, the Western media talks about nothing but climate change. I, I can't think you can go half an hour watching the BBC or, or Sky News or read a national newspaper without being talked to, uh, certainly Radio 4, about climate change with this uh, ongoing... It's almost like a religious cult uh, talking about the need to do something. Um, how, I mean, who isn't aware of it yet? Well, perhaps um, not many people, but it's not a question of talking about it. Um, it's, it's doing something. And unfortunately, the talk so far hasn't actually uh, led to sufficient action. But you, so, said, but you think... said that, but in, but in Britain, we know that Britain, of all the G20 countries, has done more uh, to tackle carbon emissions, has done more to tackle waste, more to uh, do about recycling. There are loads of things that the British government has done, not quite apart from this nonsense zero uh, net emissions target for 2050, uh, which is obviously a slightly less worse than what Extinction Rebellion won. But, but there's yeah. no doubt at all we're moving to renewable energies, no doubt at all that there have been loads of efforts to tackle. Well, you say nothing's been done. It's not just talk. On the contrary, loads has been done. We pay huge taxes right now on our fuel. Uh, We have to pay to buy a plastic bag. There are loads of things being done in terms of action to stop us uh, from adding to carbon emissions. Not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. As you say, the 2050 uh, zero net emissions um, target is nonsense. Yeah, but I think think it's nonsense because I think it's too soon. You think it's nonsense for the other reason. Absolutely. It should be 2030 or even earlier. 
But, um, you know, we we are in a crisis and playing around with plastic bags and beef burgers isn't really going to solve it. But this is what we do. As you say, it's playing around. And I'm all for let's not have a load of plastic bags thrown into the oceans. And, uh, yeah, yeah, to be fair, it it would appear that uh, we were, you know, we we don't, the life life can go on without us all having uh, single-use plastic water bottles. But what would you, what would you want done then? What do you think that you say Goldsmiths can do or the government can do, every company, people listening right now should be doing rather than, and using, you know, taking their, their bag for life to the supermarket. Uh, what, what should they be doing? Well, one of the major things the government can do is uh, an insulation project for the whole uh, of all the houses, all the homes in, in the country, so that we could cut back by 50% or more the cost of heating, so we can get rid of fuel poverty. We can create jobs as we go through that project of insulating every home. We would cut down on the amount of energy we're using, so obviously that saves every consumer money. That cuts down our carbon footprint, so that's one thing we can do. Uh, at Goldsmith College, I think they ought to uh, insulate all their buildings in the same way. Uh, they should discourage staff and students from coming by car. And in fact, they could uh, discourage travel altogether by doing more online distance learning courses. Oh, so basically, yes, yeah, stop it. It's almost stop existing, I would think. No, no, uh, no, 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 just exist in a different way. Yeah, oh, yes, but no, come on. Actually, being in the university is very, very different, uh, isn't it, uh, in terms of, as opposed to doing, uh, you know, doing your work online. Uh, thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating to talk to you. Anthony Day's Environment Consultant. He's host of the Sustainable Futures Report. That's a podcast on environmental issues. And then a couple of days later, they wanted me to talk to Mike Graham about flying royalty and whether paying to offset the carbon footprint of the flight was hypocritical. You'll see that he's sent me some homework. The Independent Republic of Mike Graham on Talk Radio. Now, before we begin, let us read uh, this statement from uh, Sir Elton John about Meghan and Harry and their trip down to visit him uh, in sunny Spain. Sir Elton says this, I am deeply distressed by today's distorted and malicious account in the press surrounding the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's private stay at my home in Nice last week. Prince Harry's mother, Diana, Princess of Wales, was one of my dearest friends. I feel a profound sense of obligation to protect Harry and his family from the unnecessary press intrusion that contributed to Diana's untimely death. After a hectic year continuing their hard work and dedication to charity, David and I wanted the young family to have a private holiday inside the safety and tranquility of our home. Uh, To maintain a high level of much needed protection, we provided them with a private jet flight. To support Prince Harry's commitment to the environment, we ensured that their flight was carbon neutral by making the appropriate contribution to carbon footprint. I highly respect and applaud both Harry and Meghan's commitment to charity, and I'm calling on the press to cease their relentless and untrue assassinations on their character that are spuriously crafted on an almost daily basis. Well, I think, what next for Sir Elton John? I think maybe a sainthood, perhaps? Maybe um, he becomes to the House of Lords, maybe put him in charge of the country? Who can say? Let's talk to Anthony Day and find out what all this carbon offsetting business is all about, because it seems like a bit of a racket to me. Anthony, very good morning to you. Good morning, Mike. Thanks very, yeah, very well. Thanks for joining us. I've, I've found this carbon offsetting company that Elton's uh, referring to, Carbon Footprint, seems to have a, a limited company address up in Islington somewhere, N1. Um, and I looked at it, it looks like if you wanted to fly, say, for example, down to Marbella from London, the carbon offset for that for a first class ticket is about 800 quid. How do they come up with that money and where does it go? Well, I don't know how, uh, how they come up with the money, but where it goes, if you look at their website, it goes to a whole range of projects uh, across the world uh, which are aimed at cutting carbon emissions. Uh, planting trees is one of the main ones, providing people with uh, clean water so they don't have to burn wood and create carbon emissions to boil the water, uh, providing people with clean cooking stoves so they cut emissions there. Um, uh, they do it across the world. They are um, authorised and they are checked by international standards organizations so that's that's where the money goes right well so how much for example would it cost to plant a tree if i said to, to, to this lot you know i'd like to plant a tree somewhere or not carbon offsetting anything i just want to plant a tree how much does that cost i don't know but i wouldn't have thought it would cost know. a great deal i oh. mean no I, I think it might cost a couple of quid probably even less than that i mean what, uh, one country planted 220 million trees in a week 
uh, a couple of weeks ago, so uh, it can't cost an awful lot. Right, no, exactly right. Well, I, bet, I wish they'd come here, whoever was able to do that, because we can't seem to get the trains running on time. I mean, if you plant well, that many trees in a week, that's pretty good going. But it just seems yeah. to me this is a little bit of a hypocritical situation we're looking at here. You know, I've got plenty of time for people who say to me, look, we need to save the world. It would be really a good idea if you stopped flying quite as much as you do. But to be wealthy enough to just say, you know what, I'm going to fly wherever I like, but as long as I pay some money to some spurious company somewhere in Islington, I'll feel fine about it. OK, yes, it's a bit hypocritical. Um, I don't know that the company is spurious. You're quite right, there have been offset scams. There have been schemes that didn't work. This one looks quite good. Um, ideally, we should send all the money out to uh, uh, reduce carbon emissions and not fly. But, well, exactly. Yeah, that's, but, I mean, that's, you need, what, I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. What the royals will do. I mean, I wouldn't but, agree with you that we shouldn't fly anywhere, but if you had that point of view, and I'm sure you may well have it, I'd be perfectly happy to, to, to let you have that view, and I would respect it. But what I wouldn't respect is if you told everybody else that we really shouldn't fly, and then you went uh, and got on straight on a private jet and flew off to Madagascar. OK, yes, all right, so that's hypocritical, but it doesn't change the science. We still have a climate crisis. Yeah, but that's not so, what we're talking about today, Anthony. We're talking about the fact that people who are, are very hypocritical... For example, I mean, look at the, the boat trip currently being taken to uh, New York by Greta uh, and, and her father and a few other people. They're flying people to New York so that they can bring the boat back here. I mean, that seems to me to be a bit of a waste of time. Right, but the climate crisis is far more important than the hypocrisy. Oh, is it? it, it Absolutely. Oh, I the see. climate crisis okay. is going to affect every one of so us. So I can be as hypocritical about it as I want then and just keep talking about there being a climate crisis. As long as I keep talking about it, that's fine. Well, I don't say that's fine, but it doesn't change the science. It doesn't well, change you've the just said the hypocrisy is less important than the emergency, so therefore if we yeah, all carry we've on being... we've got to deal with the emergency, not with not Yes, with but hypocrisy. do you not see that if you're a hypocrite, you're not dealing with the emergency? Right, well, let's accept there are some hypocrites because there are a lot of people who are not hypocrites and... And, and they are dealing with it, and we've got to deal with it, are whether they? we're hypocrites or not. Well, I saw a guy from Extinction Rebellion being interviewed on television the other day who said that six million people, or six billion people, rather, were going to be wiped off the face of the earth uh, within the next 20 or 30 years, which is clearly nonsense. Well, yeah, may well be. May well may be. Well be. Uh, well, it's well, quite a dramatic it's all, it's statement to make. I mean, this, But this is a statement that's being made by the people who say the science is very clear. Right. Well, I didn't think it was that clear. I no, mean, I, I don't, don't think it is. To see that many people wiped <laughs> off. It's a possibility. I mean, we could see twenty or thirty million people wiped off the earth, uh, or whatever the figure was, six billion. Six wiped billion. Off yeah. The earth. Yeah, we could see that if, if, for example, we get some sort of. Um, uh, virus or, or, yeah. or, or disease which we well, can't cope with. Well, you can't predict that. No, of course you can't. But that's my point. I mean, that's always my point when we have this conversation, uh, that there is a lot that you can't predict and there is a lot that you can't foresee and there is a lot that you cannot um, absolutely and utterly prove. Quite right. But as far as the climate is concerned, as opposed to... Uh, diseases and things like that, the, uh, the, the predictions are pretty certain. Well, they're predictions, though, aren't they? You can't have a certain prediction until you know what's happened. Right, but if you wait until see what's happened, it could be too late. It could be, but all I'm saying is, is you can't be sure that you will be right. Uh, you can't. But, no. Uh, so the therefore, it's not actually a climate. It's not actually a climate emergency. It might be a climate emergency. Well, the government's decided it's an emergency. The government can't prepare. decide whether they can leave the European Union or not. Never mind what the future of the world holds for us. Well, we could talk about the government for ages, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, but they have decided there's a climate crisis. They have decided that things have got to be done to reduce carbon emissions by 2050, and there are things that have got to be done to protect the country against the effects of climate change uh, by 2050. So, you know, it's generally accepted that we... Uh, you see, there's the that phrase. I'm not going to let you get away with that. It's generally accepted. I don't accept that that is generally accepted at all. There's plenty of people who don't generally accept it. And even if everybody well, did generally accept it, it is not any way to, to run a country just because an awful lot of people agree with you. It's generally accepted by the scientific community that we have a climate crisis. And the government uh, believes that we should therefore prudently take steps to mitigate and reduce the consequences of that climate crisis. They do, and they have, and all of that is correct. And that, the reason yeah. you can say all that with absolute surety is because it's happened, because people have made decisions, taken uh, action, and things have, done, have oh, been no, done, no, and things no, have been done in the past and are being done today which are supposed to be averting the climate crisis. But what you can't say with well, any surety is whether it will have any effect. 
No, I'm going to pick you up on that. They're saying things should be done. They're not doing them. I mean, if you look at the Climate Change Committee report, it says the government has identified 25 actions that should be taken and they're only, only delivered on one. Well, do you know what? So, I was talking to somebody about the National Grid yesterday and one of the reasons the National Grid is in such a parlous condition is because of all the green um, mechanisms they have put into the system to make sure uh, that we are much less uh, carbon, carbon heavy when we generate electricity in this country. So it's wrong to say that things are not being done. There are many things being done. We're also paying a tax to every single energy company that we get energy from, which is a green tax supposed to be offsetting climate change. We're also paying a massive airport tax whenever we fly on a plane from this country. So don't say we're not doing anything. Well, I'm not saying we're doing anything, and we're not doing nearly enough, though. We're not doing nearly enough. Well, I mean, we... what, what else should we be doing? Um, well, one of the things we should be doing is insulating every home in the country to cut its uh, emissions by half, to cut its eating costs by half. That'll reduce um, fuel poverty, it'll also create jobs. We should be looking to electrifying the transport fleet and getting rid of uh, fossil fuel vehicles which produce um, carbon emissions. Things like that. I mean, radical things, which unfortunately are going to be pretty horrendous, but they should have been started 30 years ago because the science was there then. Well, who's going to pay for all this, though? Well, we're going to have to. Well, who, though? Well, we want me to, to pay for it. We'll, we'll need to pay for it. We, yeah. as in what, the taxpayer? Uh, well, and the consumer, yeah. Yeah, because otherwise... We'll we already we pay a green tax for our energy, right? What's that well, being used for? Uh, probably just subsidise nuclear, because nuclear is seen as uh, emissions free. No but, what, no, but the point is that, Anthony, you're a, a man who knows about sustainable futures. You present a podcast, but you don't seem to know yeah. where any of the money goes or, or you know, how, it's, how, how anything's funded. We're already paying a load of tax to supposedly support the green economy and for us to be less carbon-heavy and carbon-using, and yet you don't know where the right. money's going or what's being spent on. Well, what I've suggested, well, I've suggested where the money should be spent. I've suggested it should be spent on, on, on greening the, uh, uh, the transport fleet and about on emission, uh, on insulating the uh, housing stock. Well, why do for example, if we were to offset uh, every flight that we went on, how would that help the world? Um, well, it all depends what projects it's invested in, but basically the aim of the project is to reduce the carbon emissions and thereby reduce global heating. No, I know and what the aim is, but what is the actual practical use of offsetting uh, your flight by paying into a company a load of money? Well, the money goes to setting up these projects to reduce carbon emissions. But isn't it all a bit of a racket, though, Anthony? I mean, you must admit, there's an awful lot of money going into these things, because mostly the only people who can afford to offset their, their holidays and their flights are people who've got quite a lot of money, right? So they're doing it to solve their own consciences. They're doing it to right. make themselves feel right. good, OK? All of which may be fine, but I don't see anybody kind of policing it. I don't know where you can find out where this money is going. Well, if it, there are the international bodies which supervise well, like and who? report on all these things. Like who? Yeah. Um... Like who? Hang on a minute. Well, I mean, who, um, can I find, who can I call and say, could you please check this company out for me? Could you please tell me what projects they've been involved in? Yeah, OK. Uh, there's the Certified Emissions Reduction Gold Standard, Certified Emissions Reduction Gold Standard, Verified Emission Reductions, and Verified Carbon Standard, Certified Credits, Quality Assurance Standards for Carbon Offsetting. There's organisations all uh, who, who look at... Uh, and who projects. runs... Are they privately run? Are they government run? I don't know, to be perfectly honest. You see, it just it seems agree, to me... Listen, that Anthony, that I'm it, sorry, I'm it, not having a go at you here. I'm just saying that, no. you know, this, this whole industry seems to me to be set up, not policed very well, uh, run on the sort of goodness of somebody's reputation, which may or may not be a good thing or a bad thing. But, you know, in the end, these things need to be policed properly. There's a lot of money involved. You're absolutely right. I think that I'll make that the next thing that I report on in the sustainable. Excellent. Report. Well, I'll tell you what, when you've done it, would you come back on and talk to us about it? Because I'm, you know, listen, I'm all in favour of people having a different view. I'm all in favour of you wanting to tell me about how da dangerous the climate is going to become and all of that. However, I just think it's a bit hypocritical of some people to put money yeah. into a fund which they honestly don't really. I mean, Elton John couldn't care less if he gives about 1,500 quid away for a couple of flights yeah. to, uh, to Nice because it's, a, it's, it's nothing to him. You know, he spends that, he spent 250,000 quid on flights hours one year you know the point is yeah. is that he's probably not going to worry about where that money goes but if i was going to do it i would want to know where the money was going right well i'll look into that okay brilliant anthony thank you very much indeed anthony day presenter of the sustainable futures report podcast he's going to go and do a bit of journalistic work for us which is always welcome here on the independent republican mike graham I want to hear from you though oh three four 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 nine nine one thousand this carbon offsetting uh, is a load of rubbish isn't it
isn't it? He doesn't take any prisoners, does he? Well, what was going to be a very brief episode turns out to be a bumper edition. I think I deserve some time off. I'll be back in September. Anyway, thanks for being a listener, and even more thanks if you're a patron. I had an online discussion with a number of patrons a few weeks ago, and I'm planning another one shortly. If you'd like to take part, please let me know. And if you're not already a patron, you can find out the full details at patreon.com slash sfr. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash sfr. And there's a transcript of this episode on the blog, which is sustainablefutures.report. Well, that's it already. I'm Anthony Day. That was the Sustainable Futures Report, and there'll be another one very soon. Thank you.